Good evening, everyone. Just another minute or so, and then we will make a start. Please bear with us. There are still colleagues joining us. Okay, I think this is a, we've got about three minutes past six. I think that's a good moment to start with today's CSS GJ seminar. My name is Andreas Bieler. I'm one of the co-directors of the Independent Center. And it's my pleasure to chair this evening's talk and to welcome our speaker, uh, Steve Battlemarch. Now, these are clearly interesting times in the UK. We are seeing a wave of strikes which we haven't for many years. Some people would say decades. Yeah, the postal workers are on strike. The railway workers are on strike. Teachers are on strike. Nurses, junior doctors, academic staff in higher education, we are on strike. So what does that mean? Yeah, what is the significance of this moment? And it's great to have with us Steve Battlemarch from the commercial services, the public and commercial services union, and he's the head of campaigns. But Steve, you've been closely involved in organizing since the 1980s, really, yeah? first as a lay rep in, in the PCS and now more in formal capacity. Of course, you're also a local Labour Party council and you are involved in politics through this route. So it will be interesting to hear from you about the strike. Strikes are back. Can they win? Now, tonight we have a shorter, sharper seminar. Steve is going to talk for about 25, maximum 30 minutes, and that will then give us another 25 minutes for comments, questions, and debate. And we are going to have to conclude our session punctually at seven o'clock because Steve, you've got to go to another meeting then. So welcome, Steve. The floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much and thanks for inviting me. And I hope uh, everyone can hear me OK. Um, I'm on Zoom and my head's cut off where I'm looking on Zoom, but hopefully you can see me and, uh, and hear me. You look um, perfect from where we are, so that's fine. Brilliant. Brilliant. OK, look, I, I want to um, talk a little bit at the beginning just about um, what my background is and in what capacity I'm speaking, because I, it kind of gives some context to what I'm going to say. Um, as was said in the introduction, I, I started, I mean, I might, I might only look 21, but I kind of started in 1980 uh, as, as an 18 year old in the civil service. And by the time I was 19, I was a, a workplace rep involved in my first strike, the 1981 pay dispute in the civil service. Uh, and as a young trade unionist through the 80s, I was heavily influenced by a series of strikes, the miners' strike in particular, 84, 85, but, you know, whopping uh, dockers, etc., all the way through the 80s. Um, and we saw the sort of rise and fall of the trade union movement. I think we're now kind of seeing it rise again. Um, so I'm going to touch on that later about membership and densities and uh, whether the unions are back or not um, in comparison to where they were many years ago. Um, but I, I was in, in, in a workplace employed uh, up until about 2011. So involved in many strikes as a, as a lay rep up until that point. And then in 2011, I was fortunate enough to be employed by the union that I was a member of, which is the, the PCS, Public and Commercial Services Union, which covers the civil <laughs> service and related areas. Um, and I've been an organiser in that union uh, and since 2017, I've been the head of campaigns uh, and political strategy. So I've, I've kind of gone from being on the shop floor to kind of being in the union, helping to organise where we're at. So. I think I've, I've certainly got 
I think, a good grasp of what's going off in my own union, or I should have. But I kind of hear a lot and see a lot and talk to a lot of people about what's going off in other unions. But I'm not here to kind of speak for PCS as such. Um, so if, if I kind of say something slightly out of turn and somebody kind of turns back around to PCS and said, do you know Steve said this? I just want to have that disclaimer at the start that what I'm giving you is a, is a very honest opinion of my own views about what's happening. Um, and I'm also going to potentially say a couple of things that, you know, sort of might challenge the norm of, of what we think about, um, you know, how good things are or, or not, because I think, you know, honesty in the movement is, is the most important thing. You can't build a campaign if you're sort of being dishonest with yourself. So I want to have a look at some of the things that have gone well and some of the things that have not gone so well and why those things might occur. Um, so let's start by looking at the current climate. The Office for National Statistics said uh, only last week, that more working days have been lost to strike action uh, in 2022 than at any time since 1989. So let's just kind of just think about that for a second. So the, the biggest strike wave since 1989. And 1989 was a bit of a resurgence towards the end of the Thatcher government. Um, people saw that they, they might not be as strong at that time as um, they'd been previously since they defeated the miners and the dockers. And there was a resurgence in 89. I think the ambulance workers were out for a long time. I think firefighters might have been out. Certainly local government workers were out, civil so servants were out. And that probably pushed those numbers up in 1989. Uh, but last year was the, was the second biggest, you know, was, was the most amount of strike days lost um, since then. I think. 2.4 million working days were lost last year. Now, 2023 probably on course to, um, to probably get near that as well, because if you think about 2022, the strikes didn't really start until the summer uh, with the RMT and then the uh, postal workers in the CWU. Um, so sort of reflecting on uh, the mood of members, I think what's happened is that the unions have spotted a, a slightly weaker government, even though it's got an 80 seat majority, uh, because of the political turmoil that's happened over, uh, over the past period. Um, but also 10 to 12 years of austerity, where members have not been able to keep pace with inflation pay rises, in many cases they've had real terms pay cuts, has kind of led a pressure cooker up to those union leaders to kind of say you've got to do something and in, in many unions there was a very willing leadership wanting to kind of listen to that and and get ahead of it and I suppose that kind of started with the RMT with it with last summer Mick Lynch becoming virtually the darling of daytime TV where he explained patiently the uh, the reasons why railway workers were going on strike and actually, even though it was massively disruptive to the travelling public, you got poll after poll after poll saying that people supported them. Now, over time, th those numbers have dipped slightly, but they were very, very high uh, in, in the middle of last summer. And, uh, you know, it got to the point where nobody wanted to go on telly with him to debate him or, you know, news people who tried to catch him out ended up with egg on their faces because Mick was very good articulating just why RMT members were going on strike. The next big wave after the RMT came from uh, the postal workers, CWU. Um, again, a very powerful union, very, a union with very high density, uh, now up against a private sector employer. Obviously, Royal Mail used to be in the public sector, got privatised, has never been brought back in. Um, whether it will be under a Labour government is, is debatable. Um, but that, that CWU strike, again, built on the backs of, of a very energetic campaign from the union leadership, uh, backed up by an incredibly popular sort of social media campaign. Uh, and obviously, in terms of postal ballots, a bit easier to persuade postal workers to use the postal service to post their ballot paper back. So you saw these pictures of postal workers lining up at a post box outside their workplace in effect to post 
their their ballot paper back. So you know, very good imagery around that because that that issue, and I'll come on to it probably in a bit, of the fifty percent um, turnout uh, to get the ballot accepted in law under the two thousand and sixteen Act. Um, has stopped a lot of unions taking action. And we'll talk about that in some of the bigger public sector unions in, in a bit. But the RMT and the CWU were smashing those thresholds. Uh, in, in some cases, 70, 80% turning out to vote and the percentage of members voting for strike action was in the 80, 90%. So um, very, very strong campaigns. But what those unions did from what we can analyze is they then went on a series of one day strikes um, or, and sometimes one or two day strikes over a long period. And I think when we got to Christmas, we got to a point where both the RMT and the CBU had, had basically had their members out for somewhere between 18 and 22 days, probably without any form of strike pay, but relying on hardship payments. Um, and if you notice that neither of them are currently involved in, in, in current rounds of action, I think they basically had to take a pause uh, to kind of recover some ground for their members. But also the CBU are now in sort of intensive talks with Royal Mail about whether they can get a settlement, obviously on the backs of the strength of their um, campaign. But also uh, another factor when we look at this strike wave is that the 2016 Act make, makes unions have to reballot after six months. So to some extent, that is a pain in the arse, <laughs> excuse my French, for, uh, for unions to have to do. But actually, it kind of keeps the dispute very live all the time. You have to keep campaigning. So every six months, you're having to reballot the membership and make sure that the membership are with you. So you can't have a ballot and kind of keep that ballot live for like three or four years. You have to keep renewing the mandate. Uh, but every time you do renew the mandate, it kind of gives the union an extra boost because you can go back to the management and say, look, you know, our members are still feeling just as strongly as they were before. Uh, obviously, if you renew the, try to renew the mandate and you lose it, it's kind of, you've lost everything. So it's, it, it's really quite important that, that reballot and when you do it. Uh, and if you, in effect, because it's six months and people normally take at least a month to do a ballot, you're having to renew the ballot sort of five months in so that you, there's no gap between your ballot mandate running out and your new ballot mandate starting. Um, what's interesting around this, this time of, uh, of the last few months is that union membership has started to go up quite rapidly. Uh, and I think this is clearly the case because we've got a lot of non-members in the, in, in the union, in, in the workplaces who for years have either kind of didn't think things affected them or they didn't think unions were effective or they didn't want to pay the money or, or whatever it was that, that stopped people joining it. They're suddenly now seeing that unions are fighting back and therefore in a union like mine we've recruited probably another five or six thousand members in, in the past three months. Now I heard that the N, uh, NEU, National Education Union, recruited thousands and thousands of people immediately after their strike which is obviously excellent uh, after their strike ballot although a slight caveat to that is the NASUWT the other big teaching union lost their ballot and I think there was some probably people switching or, or taking out dual membership from the NAS over to the NEU uh, either way it's people wanting to get involved in the action so it's a good thing but I think sometimes you just have to you know have a look behind the figures and just make sure we're not, you know, double counting in terms of where people are joining from. Um, I think one factor of all the unions that have taken action recently is a lot of them have, have gone over the past few years on what we call an organising route, i.e. to kind of move away from the old, the, what happened to unions in the 90s and 2000s of sort of a servicing structure you know, an insurance policy structure of the union, you, you join, we'll look after you if you have a, a problem, and by the way, there's some cheap insurance. Um, people have kind of turned back around to, to old school organising, making sure that there's reps in every workplace, making sure that you're talking to members at all time. This has proved some, some, for some difficulty in some of the 
public sector unions that have had a lot of homework in since COVID, because it's it's not as simple uh, as as talking to people when everyone was in the same workplace. But that organising structure, I think, has underpinned a lot of the strike action that, that has taken place. Um, and in a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll look at some of the other examples from some of the other unions. But when we look at this strike wave, we also have to look uh, at, the, at the question I was posing at the start, which is, yes, the strike wave is happening, but can it win? Uh, and in some cases, it clearly can. And in some cases, we've been going a long time and, and there's no sign of victory. So we have to look at what, what does deliver victories. Is it industrial muscle? Is it public opinion stroke political action or is it a combination of the two? And I think um, probably the easy answer is to say it's a combination of the two. But I think the industrial muscle counts far more in the private sector. Because in the private sector where you've got companies that are making quite big profits in many cases, and union members are taking action. And if they can close that workplace or that industry down, i.e. therefore no new goods can be made or sold, there is a very, very direct threat to that company's existence and uh, for, for them to uh, need to settle. And I think that's where we saw such a major campaign by Unite, uh, again, over the last couple of years. Um, and what Unite have got is a very, very big union, you know, as big as units and probably sort of well over a million members. But they are fragmented into lots of different workplaces and industries. Um, and what Unite have, have gone, gone on to do over the past um, period is they've done something called a, a leverage strategy, i.e. to kind of look at certain workplaces where the union density is strong or where they can recruit to make that union density higher and that they can exercise through industrial action very clear demands on the, on the employer and then deliver uh, some victories for those people. And US, uh, Unite have claimed that they've had over 500 disputes in the, in the past two years and they also claim that over 80% of them they've won substantial money for members. So, they're, they're, you know, let's just take that in. You know, they're claiming that's over 400 disputes that they've won and won well over the past two years. But that's not Unite balloting all one and a half million of its members. That's Unite balloting maybe 80 people in a, in a, in a, in a bus company or 200 people in a bus company or, you know, 55 people in working on the bins in Coventry or whatever it may be. These are different sort of disputes, many of them localised, many of them targeted. And I think what you, Unite also had was a very big strike fund. So a lot of what Unite were doing was in effect getting people to vote for the action, but saying to those people that they would, they would cover their wages or certainly cover uh, a substantial chunk of their wages uh, and then maybe make some of it up through a hardship fund. Because that's the other thing about strike action, particularly strike action around low pay, is people can't afford to do it. So they want, they want to take action, but they're saying, you know, like in the civil service, they're saying, you know, we're so low paid, if we then go on strike and lose 70 quid for a day's pay, you know, that's, that's 70 quid that's not against the bills that I can't pay next time. So, you know, for example, in, in my union, the vast majority of industrial action that we've taken so far has been targeted action in smaller areas aimed to try and um, upset the government in certain key departments. But we've been paying those people strike pay um, because we've built up a dispute fund over the past few years. Now, at some point, that, that dispute fund will run out if we, if, if we can't get a settlement. But at the moment, we've only had one day where everybody's come out without strike pay, which was a day where we asked the whole union to come out um, and we've got another one of those coming up in mid-march but you know we we can't afford we, you know frankly we couldn't afford to ask our members to take 18 days like the rmt or the cwf our members just would not physically have been able to afford that level of strike action so you have to kind of um change your tactics uh, according to um 
and what you think you can deliver. Um, so I, I think what, what I'm trying to say is that there's various different tactics being used by a lot of unions. The, the stronger ones were with high density in private sector areas, I think have been able to deliver a lot of leverage against their employers. And we hopefully are starting to see some victories. So the United have got a lot of local victories. CW, I think, are possibly on the verge of getting some sort of result in the Royal Mail that they're going to be pleased with. RMT tell us that really, if it wasn't for the government poking their nose in, they could probably get a deal with a lot of the rail companies who are private companies. But it appears that the government are kind of trying to stop that in many ways. Um, but then you kind of look across the public sector unions and again, it varies massively. So the, probably the best example of a victory without a shot being fired is the fire brigade union. Because initially the fire brigade union were offered 2%. They then had a ballot, uh, which they won. Uh, and suddenly the offer went up to 5%. And then they threatened industrial action. And then it, the offer went to 7%, backdated, and 5% for the following year. Now, the FBU then executive took a decision that they uh, felt that that was, a recommend, that, that was an offer that they could recommend to their members. And to be honest, I think, I think they've done brilliantly. You know, they've, they've got probably more than most, most anybody else in the public sector, and they haven't had to take one day's industrial action. And how, how come they've done that? Well, they've got a density of, of firefighters in the union of something like 95%. So virtually every firefighter is in the union. And not only that, if they'd have called action, their ballot result shows how strong it was in terms of turnout, they would have delivered, you know, and that would have caused massive disruption. But I think sometimes you have to work out when you've won and when you've not won. And I think, you know, that's what the FBU are doing now and their members are voting on that. You compare that to some of the other public sector unions, some of them cannot win a ballot because the unions are so big. So if you look at the GMB or Unison or Unite in the public sector, actually they've lost loads of ballots. They're not getting a lot of publicity, but they've, they've tried to get health workers or whatever out on, on strike, local government workers, and they've just not got the 50% turnout in the ballots. So where, they, where they're winning ballots, they're winning them in very particular areas and sometimes after a second ballot. So ambulance workers have started to win ballots, but the Unison can't win in health generally. Unite couldn't win in health generally. Uh, in my own union, in PCS, we've got 190,000 members. We'd had a couple of attempts over the past few years to try and get a ballot across the whole union, and we lost. We didn't get the 50%. We were getting like 45% turnout. So this time we went, and, and broke it down by employer because bizarrely the civil service has got over 200 bargaining units. So what we did is we, we balloted each bargaining unit separately, but on a collective ballot timetable. And we won in 120 out of the 210 bargaining units. So we still lost in quite a lot. The biggest of which was the tax part of our union, which is you know, the second biggest department. Now, again, we've, we've kind of reballoted those people and that, that ballot result is due tomorrow. And I'm quite hopeful that we'll win on a reballot. But, you know, it's, it's not straightforward in a big, um, in effect, multi-employer union to win ballots because there are, so, there are so many obstacles because of the postal ballot nature of the, of the dispute. Um, I think that these people on the call much better... Um, place than me to talk about the use the ucu um but you know you have to admire the the longevity of the campaign that's been going on and the amount of rebalance that the ucu have had to keep the pressure upon the employer and i understand they're in talks at the moment in acas but again you know what is going to bring the university bosses to the table it, it can surely has to be some level of industrial muscle but you would probably have to ask yourself or is there enough people either in the union or coming out on strike? Because I, you know, I have been on some of those university picket lines where a lot of people seem to be going into work. 
And I don't know whether they're just not members of the UCU or then members of the UCU that are choosing not to strike. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. So I think when you're in that situation where you may be not having the biggest industrial impact, you then have to win the political argument uh, and you have to persuade the employer uh, that they can't keep being continually in dispute with their own workforce. Um, so that brings me to my final point, which is about this issue of political strategy or industrial strategy. Um, we have got, we are up against the, the, the government with an 80 seat majority, although they're in the kind of last fag end of their uh, power, hopefully. They've got about another year to go. And what they're trying to do is pick off um, various bits, aren't they? So they're trying to pick off the nurses. So they take the, the Royal College of Nursing, which is, isn't a TUC affiliated union, and they took them to one side and they're going to try and do a deal with those, uh, with those nurses. Um, and why do they feel they have to do that maybe? Well, when, when anybody does a survey of deserving workers who need a pay rise, nurses are right up there. Firefighters are right up there. One or two other groups of public sector workers are right up there, teachers. And then the list comes down and down and down. And a lot of, a lot of our members in the civil service end up at the bottom of that list. And, you know, why are driving examiners, you know, less worthy of a pay rise when, when, they haven't had a drive, when they haven't had a pay rise for 10 years? But, you know, what's the public opinion of a driving examiner? It's someone who fails their kid's driving test, isn't it? Whatever. So, you know, we're not as popular as a nurse or a firefighter that's saving lives. And that's, to be honest, what the government are going off. They're going off, who can we, who can we pick off and who can, who can we do a deal with? And can we get collective action on the union side to say we're all together? Well, unfortunately, we don't appear to be able to do that because when we, my union, PCS, has talked to other unions and said, why don't we all pick our strike days on the same day and sort of all go out together? The health unions in particular, not just the RCN, but also the TUC affiliated unions, kind of met together and said, no, we want to kind of keep health separate. And that's because they think they can get a better deal on their own and they don't want to be seen to be kind of coming in on the coattails of other unions. So it is quite interesting what, what's going off, even in a united trade union movement, that people still kind of think, oh, well, maybe we can do our own little deals here and there. So we will keep putting political pressure on uh, the government. And um, The strikes are one way of doing it. We also do letter writing campaigns and all that sort of stuff. And when you do that, email campaigns you end up getting some bizarre answers from from mps both tory and labor for that matter um but we have now got down to like probably a core of about 30 or 40 mps out of 650 who really support trade unions going on strike the rest of the labor ones kind of say they do but they don't do that much about it they won't go to a picket line anymore they won't put in writing that they really support us they'll kind of say everyone should get around the table, that sort of stuff. And then the, the Tory MPs, their responses are just out and out nonsense. You know, half the time they're lying about negotiations taking place when they're not, or, or, or they're saying really ridiculous things like go and talk to your HR department when, you know, you have collective bargaining, you, you don't have individual bargaining. So, you know, most MPs don't really understand trade unions and don't understand strike action. Um, so we have got to find better ways of keeping the public pressure up. Uh, but really, if the strikes are going to win, they're going to win because of industrial muscle, in my opinion. And it'll only have industrial muscle if members feel that the union is strong enough and determined enough to carry on. And if we can find tactics to win that doesn't involve all of our members losing shed loads of money for months on end, because this is not the minor strike of 1984-85 where people were out for a year with no pay. This is a different climate where even a few days on unpaid action starts people to think, can they afford it? And if people say they can't afford it and they start drifting away from the union, we end up losing both ways. So that's where I think we're at. I think we can win. I think we are making some great, some great gains, particularly in the private sector. I think we've got a long way to go in the public sector to get things right. And I think we've got a long way to go politically if we want to have any hope of ensuring that if we do change government, 
that we'll have a different approach from Labour in the, in the future. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Happy to answer any questions, take part in any debate. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Excellent, Steve. That was a thoughtful tour de force of the situation we find ourselves in. Of course, in higher education, as you mentioned, we are also affected. Food for thought, but also still plenty of time for question comments. Who is going to start us off? And if colleagues want to switch on their uh, video, then that's appreciated. So we get a bit more of a kind of a seminar uh, atmosphere here. Richard, you've put your hand up. Over to you. Hi, hi everyone. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Steve. Um, that's really, really interesting. I'm. I should. Oh, sorry, I've got a dog here that's a bit lively. Um, I, uh, I'm a member of UCU. I'm a local uh, branch chair, and um, uh, so that I should declare my interest. <laughs> Um, I, I thought your account is is really interesting. Um, I I think the um, it's the it's the broader picture that I'm I'm curious about. I'd I'd really like to hear your view on um, labour, um, kind of very disappointing uh, change of position of Keir Starmer vis-a-vis um, -vis labour and the suggestion that they have to be a credible government and and that means that they have to step away from. Uh, active support of striking unions, which is kind of bizarre. Um, the I, I agree with your your account of uh, the current actions. I mean, they're, they're absolutely huge. So RMT, um, CWU, NEU, EIS in Scotland, you didn't mention um, the tacit support of the head teachers as well, I think is really interesting. Although we're seeing some counter examples of head teachers that are outing and blacklisting members as well. Um, the health unions, I think, um, and UCU, your own union, and um, FBW, you mentioned as well, the Fire Brigades Union. Um, but the bigger picture is really that we're, we're not just striking for pay and we're not just striking for conditions and traditional union things. All of us in our own sectors are striking for, I, I guess, the very survival of our, of our industries, of our sectors, really. Um, and uh, and that that is bringing us all together. And in fact, across the public and the private sectors, to some extent, we're struggling against the same pressures post austerity, post the pandemic, post uh, the cost of greed crisis, the current current cost of greed crisis uh, is, is making us re realize that we have these uh, material class in shared class interests and they're coming to the fore. Um, but I think, sorry, shut me up if I'm talking too much. I'm, I, I, I just want to add a couple of other points, if I may. One is the if, aggregate if you could versus just come to a question, please, Richard. And so, sure, just, just sure. because okay. we, we, we've got to stop at seven o'clock sharp. And yeah, OK. All right. in the room. Um, so position of uh, there's several questions, if I may. Position of labour is one of them. Yeah, what's going on there? The other question is the um, uh, organization for power, Jane McAlevey, the idea that, that actually there's a, a change in, in what unions are about, how real is that? And also enough is enough, people's assembly, those sorts of things that are happening on the fringe, trying to coordinate around say a national um, action. And then I guess the last thing, if I can really be cheeky, is the, uh, you mentioned it, is unite the big unions. The problem with the big unions is that they're, they're too big. You know, they operate across so many sectors um, that they can't unify and offer aggregate ballots and come out as a whole union. Um, there we go. Thank you. Excellent set of points there. Many thanks, uh, Richard. Steve, I let you respond straight away, perhaps because there's a whole range of points for comment. Yeah, I will do. Um, I'll try and do it briefly in case others want to come back. Um, I mean, I'll start with the Labour attitude to strikes. I say this as someone who's been a Labour Party member since 1982, and you know, I'm sure if this was I'm sure whatever I say, if somebody sends it to Keir Starmer, I'll probably be expelled tomorrow. So, um, it is incredibly disappointing what's gone off because clearly between 2015 and 2019, we had the Labour leadership that was in lockstep with the trade union movement, supported everything that the unions were doing 
you know, wanted to have massive trade union involvement in the Labour Party structures when the unions were in battles with, gov with the government or, or with employers was, was sending MPs out to the picket lines, including people like Keir Starmer was going out and standing on picket lines. Um, then that started to change, obviously, when we had the change in leadership. Um, and it got to the point where we've got this ridiculous position that if an MP goes, a Labour MP goes to a picket line, that the leadership is saying that's looking like we're taking sides as a party. Well, the party was formed by the trade union movement. So, yeah, I think you probably are taking a side if the unions have got a legitimate dispute. But Clearly, there's a, there's, a, there's a group of middle ground Labour MPs who don't feel comfortable with that position. I mean, the left don't feel comfortable with it at all and just defy it and just go and support people anyway. But the sort of ground, the middle ground, what they kind of tend to do is they, they will pop to a picket line. They won't have a photograph taken. They won't hold a banner or anything, but they'll go and talk to the people. And clearly, that's a basic minimum line that, we, that they should be. You know, why can't an MP go and talk to a group of constituents, uh, constituents on a picket line and find out what their issues are in the way that they would go to a business meeting or a community meeting or any other meeting? It doesn't mean that because you go to something, you automatically agree with every demand of, of the thing that you've gone to. So, you know, the absolute bottom line is that MPs, you know, all MPs should be encouraged to go to picket lines, including Tories for that matter. Uh, and, and, and engage with the workforce and talk to them. Um, but, you know, we have, we've now got in PCS, a, a rea the reality is that we've got about 30 MPs that we know will support us. Uh, it's quite sad, really. Uh, and they are almost all Labour left MPs with, with a few SNP. Um, so that's, that's where we are with that. And I think that the response to that, and will it change, well, it, I can't see it changing in the short term, but the unions have got to make it change. The unions have got to take that argument into the Labour Party again. It's not helped when the, the Unison General Secretary said that she didn't really want and peace on, on Unison picket lines. She wanted them fighting for a Labour government and all that sort of soundbite stuff. Um, so that, you know, the Labour leadership will continually quote the General Secretary of Unison when, when you have a go at them about it. Um, in terms of survival of services, I think it is quite fascinating that vast majority of the strikes have been about pay. But when you pick under the surface and people are interviewed on picket lines by the media, be it teachers, be it health workers, be it college lecturers, they often talk about the state of the service and how difficult it is to deliver that service these days and how the service is on the last legs. So in many cases, pay has kind of been the straw that's broke the camel's back. But really, you know, a lot of people are just exhausted and they need more staffing and they need a better structure for the, for the service that they work in. Uh, and I think the unions, in, in a way, are trying to highlight that as best they can, it, albeit on the backs of a pay campaign in many cases. Um, Jane McAlevey campaign about organising and deep organising. My union is very much into that. We've sent as many reps on it. All full-time staff have been sent on the course. We, we're trying to get as many senior reps on the courses as possible. You know, a fundamental understanding of our unions organised and the importance of organising, I think, is a prerequisite to, to, to being a fighting union. Um, are big unions too big? Yeah, they probably are. Um, but, you know, many of those unions are like broad churches of different groups of members in different industries. Um, but, you know, if you take um, Unite, they've got lots of smaller areas which do deliver. Um, they struggle when it's in a big area like local government or health to deliver across the board. Unison, you know, just cannot win a big ballot in, in, in local government or in health. They'll win around the edges. Uh, GMB is, again, a bit, bit different because they've got smaller groups of people in different bits. But... I think that, that they probably wouldn't win a ballot across the board. And, you know, maybe they just are too big from an organising point of view. They, they've got so many members and they've not got enough reps on the ground to, to, to communicate with them. So, yeah, it, it, trouble is no union is going to 
you know, decide that they're too big and give some members away, even even though it would make a, a lot of sense in places like health and education and the rail to kind of say, shouldn't there be a bit of a reorganisation of who does what? Um, and, and one thing I didn't mention is Amazon. You know, he's a private sector employer, massively influential, growing at all times, not really unionised at all. We've had pockets of unionisation, some really brave workers in Coventry, not only getting unionised, but taking strike action. But, you know, in some parts of the country, United are trying to organise, and in some places it's a GMB, it's a bit of a battle. You know, we've got to get better. Yeah, the, the uh, international workers, you know, they, they're like really deep, small level organising, uh, uh, you know, with, with private sector delivery workers and that sort of stuff. And there's some really inspirational stuff happening at, at that level. Um, but it's, that's quite far removed from what some of the big unions are doing. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I suggest I take two or three points if you have them in one go and then hand back to Steve again. So who else would like to raise a point, please? I'm happy to put uh, one thought into the discussion. So, so Richard just mentioned that the current situation brings us all together. To what extent is that actually the case? Yeah, there's always this talk, or oh, unions, we should coordinate our strike activities, but actually when it comes to it, all those disputes seem to have their own rhythm. And so the FBU eventually did take the deal and the offer, and I think they did rightly so. UCU has now called off the action because there's a perception in the leadership that you're making headway. And so when there is a moment to call off, yeah, the, there's not this kind of united vision beyond perhaps one or two days where we can march together. So 1st of March, the teachers are out. UCU won't be now. Yeah? And that's perhaps a missed opportunity. Some, some would say so. Question to you, Steve, what's your impression? Are, those, are we actually there all together in it? Before you get back to me, though, uh, Catherine, your point, please. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, two questions. One is again about labor. Um, just my lack of knowledge about what happened when labor was in power in the past. Uh, what happened with trade unions at the time? Was it also distant or is it something really unusual now? And the second question is Andras has just uh, well mentioned unions uh, working together. What about working together with unions in the rest of the EU? Have you gone through that experience mm. and has that led to anything at any time? Very good point. Yes, somebody recently mentioned that the British left never really engages across Europe, not just trade unions, but actually also in, in other areas. Anybody else who would like to add the point? Yes, Vincenzo, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Steve, for your presentation. Um, just a quick quick question. Towards the end, you were mentioning that, um, so this issue of finding ways of um, producing kind of industrial disruption while not losing too many days of pay for the members. And I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit on that, like where you take it to strategies like work to rule or yeah, anything um, in particular. Thanks. Thanks, Vincenzo. Steve, over to you. Okay, thanks. There's some really good points there, and some of them would be worthy of, of, of a whole new discussion. But I think the, the, the issue of coordinated action has been the, probably the most frustrating thing in this last period because people's you can't really coordinate people's pay cycles and when when they're going to likely to be in dispute and when unions feel that they can ballot. Um, PCS took a long time to get ourselves in the position that when we did ballot last autumn, um, we felt we were in the best position to win that ballot. But we're, we're in effect, we're in dispute over something that was announced in April 2022, the 2% offer in the civil service was was announced in April uh, 2022. We didn't think we could start balloting for all sorts of organizational reasons until October. 
we didn't win the ballot until mid-November. And then we started with targeted action because we felt that's what we'd said to members that we would do, that we knew that we couldn't bring out lots of people for long times with no strike pay. So we've had a kind of a, a quite a long running dispute already since November. Uh, and um, we've only like lost one day's pay for everybody and all the rest has been paid. But we have been chipping away at the, at, in the other unions by our General Secretary Mark Sawaka trying to argue at the TUC for unions with live strike ballots trying to do stuff on the same day. But there's been very little appetite for it, if we're honest, very little. We've got a little bit going off now with the NEU. Um, so on the, on the 1st of February, uh, we had joint action with the um, NEU and the UCU. And on the 15th of March, it's looking like, again, us, PCS and the NEU. And now the junior doctors of, of uh, the BMA junior doctors have announced that they'll be on strike uh, for three days that includes the 15th of March, which is budget day. But as I said earlier, some unions kind of shied away from it in terms of wanting to kind of keep their own campaign separate, like health. Um, and then the irony of the 15th of March is we're trying to get a load of people to go to London for a demonstration. So there's kind of been a bit of subtle pressure on the RMT not to call a rail strike because you wanted to get people to London for the demonstration. And we thought we'd achieve that. And then as left from the RMT on the London Underground decided that they're gonna call action on the 15th of March. So we're gonna have people stranded in bits of London and not able to get across London because other people, other workers are on strike. And our coach is going by the way, yeah, but you know, we, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat ironic that we're, we're sort of slightly bemoaning the fact that tube drivers are going to be on strike. Um, I take people back to 2011 when there was a public sector pensions strike. There were 30 unions on strike on the same day. It was November the 30th. Earlier that year, four unions, UCU, NUT as it was at the time, PCS and ATL, I think, were on strike for a couple of days in June and July. And through us chivying away, those four unions managed to get the whole of the trade union movement to ballot um, and get a strike called for the 30th of November. It was a massive strike. There was over 2 million people on strike that day. And it collapsed virtually the day after when I think Unison said, actually, we think we've done enough. Um, and I think local government leaders said, oh, we might be able to put off that pensions thing in, in local government for a year or two. And that was enough to buy them off. And then somebody else got bought off with something else. And then before you know it, the whole thing had collapsed. So we're not very good at getting our act together, in, in, in short. Um, on cross EU working, I've got nothing to say because nothing really happens, if I'm absolutely honest. I mean, it's, it's quite frightening, really, that the, there, is, there are European TUC structures uh, and people go to those meetings, but I don't think there's a lot of organising done at them. I think it's, you know, a lot of backslapping and congratulating each other that they're at least talking to each other. But I don't think anybody kind of says, we've got this massive strike wave in Britain, there's a strike wave in France, what are we all doing about it together? Uh, I think it might resolve around, you know, getting a few people to do letters of support and that sort of stuff. But I don't think there's any serious cross, cross EU um, organising being done. Um, targeted action that we're doing is about trying, in PCS, is about trying to find bits of government that we can have a, 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 an effect on government without taking the whole of the union out. So uh, whether that is driving examiners, whether that is border force workers, um, whether that is uh, people in the animal health part of the civil service, which kind of stops import and export of live animals. It's, it's those areas where we're just trying to make it a long-term campaign. We can take out small groups of people, pay them to do it, and have long-term disruption to the government. We think that's better for us than saying we're going to try and take the whole of the civil service out for three days because actually if you're going to beat the government you'd have to take the whole of the civil service out for really a month 
and no one's got the money, no one's got the savings to, to commit to a month, month's worth of strikes. Um, the other targeting action that often gets talked about are things like work to rules and overtime bans and, and stuff. But um, again, you have to separately ballot for them. And when you put two ballot papers on the same, uh, two questions on the same ballot paper, there is a percentage of people that go for the lower option. Um, so they'll look at it and uh, most people say, I want to do both. But some people say, oh, well, I'll, if there's a choice of not taking strike action, I'll, I'll just do the work to rule. And because the ballots are so tight sometimes, people are very reluctant to put two questions on a ballot paper because they don't want to lose the strike ballot by giving people a lower option. Uh, so that's that, that's that. In terms of labour in power, um, seems like a long time ago. Uh, but there were disputes, it, even in the 97 to 2010 government, there were disputes. The unions initially were very quiet from, from my memory, very, very quiet. You know, things can only get better. National minimum wage, the, the sure start. We, we, we were constantly getting a few things that we hadn't had for 18 years legal right to join a trade union. So people felt some relief from the Thatcher major years um, and some of the, the sort of industrial battles kind of subsided for a bit. But getting towards the back end of that Labour government, things did start to hot up again. And I think the unions now won't, won't be so compliant under a Starmer government. I don't think they will. And I think there'll be a lot of pressure, political pressure put on Labour MPs to support union demands. Obviously, way back when, in the sort of 60s and 70s, it was completely different. The unions were much, much stronger. Um, 13, 14, 15 million people in unions rather than six or seven. And, you know, so strong that, you know, they would be in number 10 with Labour government spear and sandwiches trying to work out, you know, how to resolve issues uh, at the local level. So it's a completely different ball game to then. Um, but I do believe that if if we get a Starmer led government, we will um, the unions will be a bit stronger than we were in ninety seven to two thousand ten. Thank you, Steve. So we've got five minutes left in our shorter seminar tonight. So I give the word to Steve and then Daphne for their questions and contributions, and then the final word to Steve. So battle match. So first Steve Davis, then Daphne, and then back to Steve. Thanks very much, Steve. That's really interesting. I think there's, there's loads, there's, there's loads to learn, as you as you said, from the strike wave so far, both positive and negative. Some of the negative things are really obvious: organisational failings and sectionalism, and so on. But the positive things, I think, are more interesting. The the fact that hundreds of thousands of workers are taking action for the first time ever in their lives. New 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 layers of reps. New new layers of uh, organization in the in the workplace revival of organization at the workplace new new members and so on. there's lots of good stuff striking for the first time for for whole unions like the rcn and so on but a lot of this is still lacking a big victory really uh, i mean you mentioned unites private sector victories which are slightly different but in the public sector uh the fbu for example if they do accept as by march the 6th when they finish their consultation it will still be a cut in pay. It's it's not inflation level pay rise. What they're what they're um, what they're they're voting on. So my question really is, what do you think victory looks like? Because we need we need to have a sense of victory in order to sustain the growth in confidence that's happened as a result of these new levels of activity. Is there somebody else going to got a question as well? Is it De De yes. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much for the conference. Um, I wonder if you receive the unions receive any support from environmentalists. You know, they are particularly strong uh, in the UK. And I wonder, you know, if you receive any support from them because they are particularly receiving support for the, from the youth as well, or the divide between red and green still valid. Uh, uh, you know, uh, quick question from my side. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Steve, over to you for the final comment. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I, on that second point first, um, 
my own union PCS wrote to the leaders of all the political parties during this dispute and asked for a meeting with them. Um, most of the leaders of the political parties haven't even deigned to reply, but we did get a reply from Caroline Lucas from the Green Party, who sent her full support. Um, whether that has translated much down to Green Party members and councillors, I'm not sure, but I think you know she's certainly saying that her, she's she's given us her full backing and has made public um, pronouncements about that, and we have promoted that. Um, the other two political party leaders who have responded and also indicated support to different levels is Plaid Cymru, the, the Welsh Nationalist Party. Uh, they've got four MPs. They've written back with full support. And the Scottish National Party have written back, sort of it, saying that there is support, but you know the letter from him is, is slightly less enthusiastic than others. But we have got a couple of very, very good SNP MPs in Glasgow who are very supportive. So there is some sort of cross-party maybe left of labour if you want to call call it that support for our uh, disputes um the the young workers that both of you mentioned what we again what we have noticed in pcs is a massive growth of of new, both new members and new activists and a lot of them being people brought into struggle for the first time uh, so a lot of our activists on the picket lines on the first of february uh were boosted by how many new people that were there, people who hadn't been on strike before, uh, people who hadn't been a rep before. And in, in London in particular, there's a whole range of people who are young workers in London who are, you know, so affected by the cost of living crisis and the housing crisis that they are becoming really radicalised. One of my colleagues told me a story that they went and had a meeting with probably about 25 of these young reps uh, after one of our events and spoke to them about what brought them into the union movement and what brought them into to taking strike action and all that. To a person, they were all radicalised and energised by the Corbyn movement in, in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. But with the exception of literally one or two, they'd all left again uh, once Corbyn had... Um, been um has left the leadership and, and in effect has been ostracized but this radical group of members are now in effect taking leadership roles in in the trade union movement which is great to see uh, and uh, you know hopefully they will be the future of the trade union movement when, when old dogs like me move on um, which we need to do um what does a victory look like i think it looks like um what the members feel that it is, and therefore, if uh, and that might be a bit of a fudge, Steve, but I think if the FBU members vote for that deal, which I think they probably will, I think they'll feel like they've won something. Yes, I know that it, 7% and 5% is not exactly 10% or whatever, but it's 7% it's backdated um, to last April. It's 5% coming in from, from this April. They haven't lost a day's pay in strike action. Um, they have shown their industrial muscle and they know that they can come again if they need to. So I think uh, that's quite a, a good result for them, uh, if I'm honest. Um, and the fact that it was unanimous on their executive and they're not, you know, they're not a moderate union, they're a left union. And, but the fact that they felt that, that they got a deal that they had to support, um, I think s s says something about it. Um, of course, the other thing to remember there is, again, it's, that was a local government uh, decision to give that award. And it was a cross-party local government decision that runs the fire authorities across the UK. And as I understand it, you know, Labour councillors, a Sinn Féin councillor from Northern Ireland, a Lib Dem councillor, there was all sorts of people who were on that fire authority backing that award. The Tories opposed it. Um, Tories wanted to stick at 5%, the, the other people pushed for 7 and in the end 7 was offered. Uh, so that's quite interesting. I think the, the, the wins that Unite are getting in the private sector shouldn't be sniffed at. They are getting substantial pay awards for their members 
in the private sector, as are the GMB and others in, in some of the private sector areas. I think in, um, in the rest of the public sector, I think we're probably going to end up with some score draws. You know, the reality is that we, we are directly employed by government in, in the PCS and they are not going to concede to us, I'm sure, unless they feel they absolutely have to. And what they might do is concede to us in effect for 2023 and build some more money into 2023 and hope that it buys us off. Um, I think the, the one that I'm really watching, is, or the two that I'm really watching, is the RMT and whether they feel they can get a deal at some point or whether that's going to go back into a big dispute. And the CWU, the postal workers, because I think the postal workers were getting to the point where the very industry was at, was at stake and the management was so appalling that you wondered what was going to happen with, with, with the, the future of the post office. Uh, so if they get something where they've basically clawed their way back in to um, protecting jobs and services and get a pay rise out of it, I think the CWU will, will, will think that that's uh, 18 days worth of strike action that's paid off. So we'll have to keep a very close eye on that one as well. All right, thank you. Brilliant, I think that's a good comment to finish on. So thanks a lot again to Steve Battlematch. Let's show our appreciation in the usual way. Yeah, hot and sharp, but very thought provoking. And of course the strife wave, strike wave is ongoing. So more to watch out for, but thanks a lot, Steve, for your insights. Many thanks to our participants and the questions. Uh, we will be back. Our program is on the internet available, but for tonight, this is it. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.